Hello. Good evening. So it's wonderful to see everyone here tonight for the 2023 Dunbar Lecture in Philosophy. It's the first time we've been able to hold this, this lecture uh, that we've had annually so consistently from 1988. It's the first time since the pandemic started. So uh, I'm Kristen Golden. I teach in the philosophy department. I direct the Peace and Justice Studies program. And um, I'm so looking forward to, to introducing Dr. Nancy Tuana, who is giving tonight's lecture. But before I do, a couple of things uh, that I need to tell you. After the lecture, there will be a reception with food and beverages uh, just to your left in, in our events room. You're all welcome to come and join the convert, continue the conversation. And I hope you, you will join us. The Dunbar Lecture um, is here because Jack Dunbar was a Millsap student in the 1950s. And he became a very successful trial lawyer. And in the mid 80s, he wanted to recognize our program because he felt like he learned a great deal about how to think carefully and critically. Um, and in particular, a philosophy professor was very influential um, and helpful to him, Dr. Ra Bob Bergmark. Uh, and the, so he, he created the lecture series. The, the one guideline that he gave was, uh, he said, the topic of the lecture could not be too conservative or too, too liberal. And initially, it was, it was misunderstood to mean, oh, he wants something middle of the road. But he went, but what he really meant was, everything is on the table. You could not be too conservative. You could not be too liberal. Stretch people's minds however, however seems appropriate. Um, our 2023 Dunbar lecturer is Dr. Nancy Tawana. Dr. Tuana is DuPont Class of 1949 Professor of Philosophy and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Penn State University. She has authored many books, and uh, her recent monographs include Racial Climates, Ecological Indifference, and Eco-Intersectional Analysis. It was published a month ago. Uh, also, Beyond Philosophy, Nietzsche, Foucault, and uh, Anne Zaldua. That was published with Charles Scott in 2020. She's also edited many, many volumes. And these include uh, the 2020 uh, volume, Toward Decolonial Feminisms, Tracing the Lineages of Decolonial Thinking Through Latin American Latinx Feminist Philosophy. Uh, also, an edited volume, 2019, Race in the Age of the Anthropocene. Uh, a, that was a, a special volume of the journal Critical Philosophy of Race. Uh, and the third edited volume of so many that I chose to include is from, is going, digging way back to 1989, Feminism and Science. And this anthology uh, it became a book in 1989, but it initially was a special issue of Hypatia. Hypatia is the first um, feminist philosophy journal and has been incredibly important for women in philosophy. And Dr. Tawana was there at the start of Hypatia and was a primary editor for many years. Hypatia, it's named after an Egyptian, uh, an ancient Egyptian mathematician, philosopher, woman, Hypatia. Uh, Nancy Tuana's work at Hypatia helped change the face of philosophy to include female faces, and it led to, uh, and it led to her role as founding director of the Rock Ethics Institute in 2001. Through Dr. Nancy Tuana's leadership. The Rock Ethics Institute continues to bring experts together from across disciplines 
Its purpose, according to its mission statement, is to, quote, motivate high-impact ethics research and to solve problems translating research into practical solutions. For this and other work, Dr. Tuana has received a number of enormous grants. Just last August, she received an NSF Coastlines and People Program grant. Um, that grant uh, project is called Megalopolitan Coastal Transformation Hub. <laughs> its, uh, its acronym is MOC, and it's almost $20 million. She's one of seven principal investigators. The purpose of MOC is to create, quote, climate resilient decision excuse me, to create a climate resilient decision making framework to equitably support coastal communities. Prior to the mock grant, Dr. Tawana received other major grants, including in 2017, the National Science Foundation Sustainability Research Network grant. Uh, that was for almost 12 million. She was a co-principal investigator. And in 2016, she received an NSF grant for a project called Visualizing, Visualizing Forest Futures Under Climate Uncertainty, Integrating Indigenous Knowledge into Decision Support Tools for Collaborative de Decision Making. I am pleased she is here tonight to talk to us about racial climates, ecological indifference. Will you join me in welcoming Dr. Nancy Tawana? It's really a pleasure to be here tonight, and I thank you all for coming out. And I thank you particularly for the very gracious introduction. You can probably get a sense from the types of things that um, Dr. Golden mentioned about me that I work in the field of climate change. Um, and one of the things that I worry a lot about um, in that context is the issue of climate justice. So I want to talk with you tonight about the ways in which I think our contemporary conceptions of climate justice need to be expanded and need to be broadened in a variety of different ways, in ways that um, require us to attend to both what I call racial climates and ecological indifference, something I'll talk with you about tonight. So climate change is something where we've been studying the work of the ways in which human influences have, have been having an impact on various aspects of the climate. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a group of scientists who regularly meet in order to um, provide summaries of the best available published science to give both the public as well as policymakers information on what we know about changing climate. In the most current assessment report that was published in 2020 uh, for the physical science basis, the conclusion was that it's unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, the ocean, and the land, and that various widespread um, changes are happening across the globe. One of the ways to think about this is to go to the NASA page, which is really helpful if you really want to know more about how we think about climate change. It's a great resource. One of the things that's happened is that our greenhouse gas emissions have risen to now 419. Every time I go back to this page, all of these numbers change, but unfortunately they don't change often for the better. Now that number is significant because it's a significant increase from the time of the Industrial Revolution in the 1880s when the um, atmospheric carbon dioxide was 280 parts per million. That matters because what's happening is that that excess carbon dioxide is causing a warming of the uh, entire globe, the global temperature. Right now it's 1.1 degrees Celsius and that temperature rise is having all the other effects you're seeing. It's melting ice sheets. It's having an impact on the Arctic ice sheet. 
and it's raising our sea levels to four inches now, um, as well as warming our oceans, which has an impact on hurricanes and other um, various um, storm surges. So when we talk about 1.1 degrees C, it doesn't seem like very much, but if you translate it into Fahrenheit, it's almost two degrees change in global temperatures. And what we see is a change that starts to have an impact. We'll see if my animation will work. This is, again, an animation that's put together by NASA that looks at the ways in which, over a time period, it starts in 1880. Come on, you can move. I know you can. Um, we'll, see if it, we'll see if it works. It starts to, it's loading. We're slow. But basically what it'll do is, if it ever starts to work, it will show the ways in which the temperature has shifted over time. And weather does change. It doesn't stay stable. But what you'll start to see, come on, baby, you can move. Aha. So what you start to see is these variations in temperatures. The blue color is cooler than normal. The, in the yellows and oranges is warmer than normal. And over the decades, you start to see variations, which weather does vary. But come on, you can do it. Keep going. <laughs> My ethernet connection must not be very strong. If it ever gets up to the 1990s, one of the things that you'll see, OK, we're going to go really slow. Come on, baby. Oh, come on. You can do it. I know you can. Uh -huh. OK. So we're the 50s now. And now we're going to lag. Hmm. Come on, sweetie. Come on. You gotta, I gotta get, I've got to get you up to the 90s, or this, the animation won't, won't be very impressive. Maybe not. Come on. I may have to give up. There we go. We're up to the 70s, and we're lagging. Come on. So I'm not going to be, do very, be able to do very many of my animations today, because I think my Ethernet connection isn't strong enough for some reason. But just notice, now that I'm in the 90s, notice how the colors are now in the warming areas. And as we get up into the this century, you get even more warming um, to the point where um, basically the graphic is almost stopped at this point. And you'll notice most of the temperature variations are now in the higher degrees. But global warming doesn't happen uniformly everywhere. Notice how on the top of the graph, you have a much higher temperature. And that's why we're getting so much Arctic ice melt. And that's why we're getting so much sea level rise. So one of the things that we see when we look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports is that climate change is already affecting every inhabited region across the globe. Um, and what that means is that we're seeing climate change impacts almost everywhere. Um, and it's impacting almost everyone, from um, the fires that are raging across the west coast of the United States. Just thinking about the United States right now, um, the fires that are raging there in much higher um, numbers and greater velocity than ever before, to the hurricanes and storms that are picking up higher intensity because of warming ocean waters on the east coast and in the Gulf, and then both droughts as well as floods, and you know floods really well, because you've been having precipitation events that, have causing, that are causing floods and are having an impact on aging infrastructure. So one of the real worries we have right now in the United States is the ways in which changing temperatures are going to put even additional stresses on aging infrastructures it did on your Curtis water plant. Even though climate change has an impact on almost everyone, almost everywhere, it impacts some regions more than others. And that's what a lot of people talk about when they talk about climate justice. 
You'll notice that the countries here, the darker the color, the more, the higher the impacts will be. And those impacts are both because of where they're located as well as their adaptive capacities. Um, one of the ways to think about climate justice, it's a very complicated concept, is to think about the ways those who are most responsible for emissions are uh, often the least impacted. So you notice that um, countries like the United States that are amongst uh, the most responsible for emissions along with Europe, it's also the least impacted. And countries such as countries in the continent of Africa, with the exceptions of a few countries that have contributed least to emissions, are the ones most impacted. Now, those emissions are changing all the time. And I'm not going to show you this graphic because it'll go too slowly. But if you did the animation of how emissions are distributed, these are um, ways of mapping that give the size of the country based on the, the number of emissions. Okay? So this is emissions per capita. These are total emissions. But emissions per capita starts to have a different kind of measure. And in particular, even though, for example, China and India's emissions are increasing and have increased over the past decades, if you do a per capita analysis, you see that China's emissions are about half of those in the United States. And India's per capita emissions are even less. So you get the US, we're not the highest. We're about, uh, this was in 2018, we're about 18 and about 18 and a half tons um, of carbon emissions per person, whereas China is about half, 8.87, and India is significantly lower. Is this, this one's not picking up? OK. But if we think about climate justice, we even have to complicate it all the more. And it's been now about two decades that a number of feminists have been arguing that you also have to look at gender. Because women are often differentially impacted by climate change because of the roles they have, because of their locations. But they also often are less involved or less included in policy de decisions. And so there's been a lot of work done on bringing a gender lens to climate justice and thinking about the ways in which decisions on how to adapt to climate change can differentially impact women and men because of gender roles and how a well-intentioned adaptation approach might actually make the situation worse for women. One lens, however, that hasn't been as adequately addressed until relatively recently, and one I've been working on, is the way in which race is also something that needs to be brought to attention when we're looking at issues of climate justice. And in particular, to think about how we need to really bring what um, scholars like Patricia Collins and Kimberly Crenshaw referred to as an intersectional approach, where we understand the ways in which different ways in which people are situated and the various different assumptions and institutional impacts on those different identities actually co-merge and, and interact so that you can't just look at gender separately. You need to look at gender alongside of race, alongside of class, alongside of other variables. In fact, the last working group, IPCC working group, came up with a graphic that tried to represent that kind of intersectional um, connection between um, vulnerability to climate impacts. And they had a variety of different factors, class, gender, ethnicity, age, race, and ability, and thinking about the ways in which they come together so they can't be separated out in order to think about what's needed for justice. So let me think about this a little bit with a graph like this that talks about going from changes in the climate, such, such as shifting rainfalls and warming temperatures, to hazards that can happen, those violent storms, extreme heat, to various impacts on humans. 
primarily health impacts. Um, one of the things that I argue is that differential impacts are really only part of the story, and although very important, are not sufficient. And here I follow along the guidelines of Iris Marion Young, who argued that if you focus only on differential impacts, you risk obscuring issues of how, what's underlying those differential impacts, the kinds of institutional organizations, the kinds of structures that underlie them. In other words, we have to look at the ways in which there are systematic um, practices as well as beliefs that underlie these differential impacts. To try to get at that, what I've done is to develop a five-pronged view of what I call racial climates, or the role of race when we look at issues of climate justice. It includes differential impacts. They're very important, and we want to make sure that we think about them. But what I argue is not it's not enough to look at them on their own. We need to look at the other dimensions. And so I want to spend a little time talking about that today in the context of one of these hazards, namely extreme heat. What's really interesting and what people often don't realize is these heat waves we've been experiencing here in Europe, everywhere, actually have had more fatalities. There are more climate-related deaths due to heat than to flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes put together. One example is the 2003 European heat wave that resulted in 53,000 deaths. A lot of deaths happened in this heat wave. In addition to those deaths, there were um, various different grain shortages because of the affiliated droughts that happened in southern Europe. So when we think about extreme heat, one of the things we have to think about are what policies we're looking at and why we're looking at those policies. So in the original Kyoto Protocols that were part of the UN efforts to try to get a global solution to climate change, the effort was to try to stay below 2 degrees C. Remember, we're already at 1.1 degree, so we're on our way to 2 degrees. The problem was, as was pointed out by uh, Joni Seeger over a decade ago, and this, these are her terms, that 2 degrees C is a safe target only for, quote, temperature latitude rich countries. For the millions of people in poor countries, low latitude countries, low lying states, and small island states, 2 degrees C is not acceptable. For the dozens of states already pushed to adaptive limits, a two degrees C cap, even if achievable, is too little too late. For fragile ecosystems, two degrees C of warming is not a safe target. That was two decades ago. The IPCC relatively recently started to agree with Joni Seeger, looking at how much our impacts will um, increase if we go to the originally thought safe target of two degrees C, and for just to translate it into Fahrenheit. It's 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit is 1.5 degrees Celsius. Part of what we're worried about are the ways in which certain impacts start to cascade. They start to multiply exponentially and it can even trigger um, abrupt changes. So in that question of what's a safe target, we have to think about safe for whom and where and how that happens. Bishop Tezen Tutu was worried about this, and he coined the phrase climate apartheid. His worry was that as we start to try to address um, ways to adapt to climate changes, that we're doing it in ways that are actually causing what he calls climate apartheid that the rich world, the people in the rich world are being protected, but those in poorer countries are exposed to the harsh reality of climate change in their lives. So we have to really think about the ways in which our actions may actually be causing this, kind, this different kind of apartheid. 
So to bring it home, I always like to bring it home a little bit. Here in Mississippi, you've been experiencing increasing temperatures. And if you go to the Jackson Greening Project, or 2 degrees C, Mississippi, you'll see quotes like this, that heat's on the rise. And what they say was in 2021, there were 47 days, I probably need to stay by the mic, there were 47 days where the temperature reached 95 degrees. But what they're worried about is what's going to happen in the future. So these are projections, but it's expected by 2030 that rather than 47 days where the temperature is at 90, hits 95, there will be 58 days. Now, that's important because of the way in which heat works. We have a phenomenon called heat islands. If you're in a built-up area like the downtown or an industrial area, that area is going to be warmer than suburban areas or rural areas. So cities are seen as heat islands because of the ways in which um, structures like buildings and paved surfaces actually trap heat and make the cities warmer. But there are heat islands within cities too. Even if you're downtown in a city, parts of that city are bigger than other parts of the city. And I'm really going to hope this graphic works, because this is a really cool one. If you don't know about the Jackson Greening Project, um, go find out about it, because it's really neat. So the Jackson Greening Project is a group of citizen scientists who got together to take a look at what the heat is like in your city. And they came up with this amazing graphic. Um, if it was showing properly, the reason it's changing colors is they got measurements of parts of the city in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. And you can, if you, you can map out parts of the city that are significantly hotter than other parts of the city. And these are called heat islands within cities. And what they do is they took a snapshot, go explore this web page, because it's super cool, um, and a great activity to get involved in, is they took one of their maps, this one, and they went and focused down, zoomed in on it, to show you a section of the city that's hotter than other sections, and then they remove the color. And what you see is why it's so much hotter. This the section in here is, the red over here is so much hotter because underneath are all those buildings that are trapping heat. Um, so the reason why that is relevant to climate justice is, uh, well, before I get there, one of the things that they pointed out is that parts of the city here in Jackson are up to 10 degrees hotter than other parts of the city. Okay. So if it's 95 outside, it could be 105 in that part of the city. Now, bring another dimension to bear, and those are structural dimensions. And that's the ways in which heat and poverty often intersect. So now I'm going to travel to a city very close to where I grew up, in Oakland, California, where there's a really high correlation between poverty and this heat island effect. So on this side of the graphic, the darker the color, the hotter the part of the city. But on this side, the lighter green, the more poor those neighborhoods are. And what you see is a direct correlation between heat islands within the city and poverty within the city, where uh, wealthier neighborhoods are often cooler. Now, the reasons for this are multifold, of course. There tends to be more vegetation in wealthier parts of the city, more parks, less um, paved areas, often less density of buildings. And those, all those phenomena have an impact on those differential impacts. So again, we'll move cities, go to Baltimore, Maryland, where in 2018 there was a heat index of 103. And what you see were not only deaths, but a series of real increases in emergency calls, primarily because of heart illnesses. Um, high temperatures cause various different issues. 
cardiac arrest, high blood pressure, COPD. In fact, in the Chicago 1995 heat wave, when 739 people died, we start seeing some of those intersectional effects because most who died were elderly and poor. Okay? So you can start to see very quickly why that would be the case. Elderly are more susceptible to the impact of high heat. The poor are less likely to have access to cooling facilities, air conditioners in their house. A disproportionate percentage of those who died were black. And I'll come back to why that was. And interestingly, a significantly greater percentage of those who died were men than women. Why, you might ask? The reason there is that they found that men were much less likely to have a support system, either relatives or friends who would check on them, make sure that they were OK, and make sure they got help if they weren't doing well. But why, why was a disproportionate percentage of those who died black? And to answer that, we actually have to look at historical lineages. Because one of the correlations between heat and poverty are also correlations between heat and racial climates. So now I'm going to move to the city of Detroit, where there's basically where the entire city is one big heat island. This is the inner part of the Detroit city. Um, and it's also an area where there, the, air, the city, this part of the city, is for the most part um, uh, composed of people who live either at or below the level of poverty or low middle class. This part of Detroit is both um, uh, three, I think two thirds of the people who live there are living at or below poverty, and 77% of people who live in this part of the city are black. Now, to understand why that is, we have to start looking at historical legacies. And those historical legacies take us to a different kind of apartheid, a kind of apartheid that we experienced here in the United States. And that was the ways in which um, neighborhoods that started off as integrated were segregated. And they were segregated in complex ways. So in cities like Detroit and cities like Chicago, many neighborhoods were were integrated, where oftentimes immigrants who came to be seen as white, um, there's a longer story there, and um, blacks lived together in the same neighborhood. In the 20s, that started changing, and the whites in the neighborhood started forcing blacks out of the neighborhoods through a variety of means, either threats of violence or actual violence, and also through zoning, changes in zoning laws. and um, making it more difficult for blacks to remain in the neighborhood and starting to create segregated neighborhoods that were very carefully patrolled. That somewhat informal, more informal practice got solidified in the 30s when the Depression hit and there was an effort by the federal government <clears throat> to um, try to protect homeowners' property. And they did that through the Homeowners Loan Act of 1933. What the government did was to refinance homes at a much lower mortgage rate so people could save their homes in the middle of this really difficult um, economic depression. But they didn't do it for every neighborhood. What they did is they went into, this is um, Detroit, they went into neighborhoods and decided, OK, which parts of the neighborhood are actually good investments for refinancing loans. And they did, it, they did a color coding where green was the, the, and blue, green and blue, were the areas most likely to be refinanced. And those areas that were either yellow or red, red were never refinanced, yellow were very seldom refinanced. And the way they made that decision was to see what the racial composition of those neighborhoods were. If they were predominantly black or mixed black Latino, they were coded either red or yellow and not um, covered under the Homeowners Act. Now, that decision was made illegal in the 1968 with the Fair Housing Act. But the, that legacy lived on um, because even though it was no longer legal 
to um, limit where certain groups of people lived. 75% of the neighborhoods historically redlined, which is what this is called, remained, remained to today predominantly low to low middle class um, um, income neighborhoods. And 64% of those neighborhoods remain minority neighborhoods. So what happens is that past and current policies and structural dimensions continue to circulate and have an impact on what I call racial climates. Now, why that's important, and particularly important at a time when we're experiencing heat waves, is because formerly redlined districts across the US are on average almost five degrees Fahrenheit warmer than non-redline districts, and in some cities, up to more than 12 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. So there's a way in which those histories live on, and they get cemented, in a sense, into the ways in which we experience the world. Now, racial climates also have psychological dimensions. So psychological dimensions can be what happens, remember we're talking about heat for the most part right now, what happens when we have a heat wave? What happens often is that crime um, increases, crime rates increase, there's more depression, more suicides, um, also higher drug use. Um, so it can be a very stressful time. But those psychological dimensions, there are other kinds too. And they are both systemic and individual. And they're what Patricia Hill Collins called controlling images that get literally into our psyches and into the way we think about um, the world. This is what um, movements like Black Lives Matter are trying to address, the ways in which they're controlling images in which certain groups of people are seen as less than and are not protected. So if we think about controlling images and the ways in which they circulate in our society today, and I'm just gonna talk about the US because racial climates are different in different locations and different time periods. But if you think about the US, you might think about the ways in which um, um, when whites are free to shop wherever they want to, not always the case with blacks. As Patricia Williams discovered, when she tried to shop at a Benelton in New York City and was evicted by the white sales clerk saying that the shop was closed, even though it was very clearly on the door that the shop was open and there were white shoppers in the store. Or the ways in which stop and frisk practices, what sometimes are called driving while black, has an impact on the rates of police uh, stop and frisk efforts. So in New York City, where blacks make up um, more than 46% of the individuals stopped by police, um, but only 23% of the population in New York City. We see that real inequity circulating through, not because blacks in driving in cars or walking down streets are doing things differently than whites are, but because there are ways in which sensibilities have expectations that are resulting in um, <clears throat> differential treatment. Just as we know that um, while well, blacks account for approximately 14% of the US population, they're killed by police at more than twice the weight of white Americans. Or it might be something like the sensibilities of individuals, like Amy Cooper, who, when asked by um, Christian Cooper um, to please leash her dog, which was the rule in uh, Central Park, she called the police, and called, made a 911 call, claiming that she was being threatened. And even when police aren't involved, they're often affective responses where people um, will feel unsafe when around, if a, if a, a walk to the other side of the street, or as George Yancey referred to, when he walked into an elevator, women would clutch their purses more tightly. But racial climates, um, like uh, anthropogenic climate change, 
don't impact all regions in the same ways. Racial climates for Latinos in the United States are not identical to the racial climates for blacks in the United States. Although they too are often stopped and frisked more often than whites, um, they're treated often more likely to be treated as unwanted foreigners. And their histories are different as well. For indigenous people in the United States, there's uh, exclusion from land, denial of culture, denial of language that impacts both their life experiences but also expectations. We saw these shifts in sensibilities and shifts in racial climates with the COVID pandemic where Asian Americans were experiencing far higher levels of aggressive behavior and prejudice, as well as Arab Americans who often are, experience um, various different racial climates. To complicate this all more, okay, so what I'm trying to do is complicate what we mean by climate justice, I argue that there's another dimension that often it gets ignored, and that's what I call ecological indifference. And in order to share with you what I mean by ecological indifference, I want to move again, and now I'm going to move to Brazil, um, to Yanomani territory, which actually covers the area between uh, Brazil and, and Venezuela. The Yanomani are an indigenous people who've lived on this land for centuries but their life and life ways are being impacted and severely impacted by illegal gold mining that started, that's been happening for the past um, about seven years on Yanomani land. Now this is protected land and this is illegal, but miners come in and dig huge pits. These are massive pits um, that disrupt the uh, ecosystems and cause um, mud to get into the rivers that both um, has an impact on, on fish breeding, but also in order to get to the gold, they use mercury um, to separate the gold out. And that mercury is poisoning the rivers such that anyone who drinks the water or eats the fish that live in the river ends up themselves getting affected by the mercury so that the Yanomani people who drink the water and eat the fish, as well as the otters, as well as the um, river dolphins, as well as the Yakari caimans, are all having various different health impacts because of the illegal mining. Now, ecological indifference, by ecological indifference, I mean the attitude of both separating, making a hyper-separation between humans and the environment and then seeing only humans as having intrinsic worth, such that um, the rest of the world is seen as having value only for its use for humans. As the environmental author um, David Abram puts it, the term environment, this is his quote, the term environment locates us humans at the center as the only thing that's not environment since all other beings are our environment, they are what surrounds us. This type of attitude of the environment as something to be used by us, as something that doesn't have intrinsic worth, is another missing dimension when we start to think about climate justice, and one that I think needs an augmentation of intersectional approaches to have now an eco-intersectional approach where we do it by not seeing a radical separation between humans and environments, which lets us see the ways in which the disposability of certain types of ecosystems are often intertwined with this disposability of certain groups of people. So back to Brazil and back to the Anamani people, Bolsonaro, who was elected president in January of 2019, expressed both of those and expressed both ecological indifference and systematic racism in the same way. Bolsonaro just was defeated and is no longer president this year. But while he was president, a variety of things happened. First of all, he eradicated our basically environmental limitations, didn't um, 
um, weakened any kind of punishment for environmental impacts because he said, look, economic development is more important than environment, protecting environments. And he also wanted to completely disband indigenous protected territories, arguing that indigenous people, and this is, these are his words, not mine, are like animals in zoos. They need to be taken off the land and put into a context in which they can become civilized. And often talked about the US approach to indigenous people as a preferred way to deal with in the indigenous people of Brazil. Since his presidency, fires have broken out all across the Brazilian Amazon in numbers far greater than had been happening prior to that time. Now, the Amazon is a really important rainforest and has an impact on our weather in multiple ways. It not only um, sequesters carbon, but it also is sort of, people refer to it as the lungs of the earth because of the ways in which it impacts, um, sucks up carbon dioxide and um, provides oxygen. But the rainforest is burning in part because Bolsonaro was encouraging industrial farming and mining, both which required destruction of the rainforest. Part of what was happening was the um, people burnt, taking down the rainforest in order to create charcoal, which is a big industry in Brazil. And here we see an interconnection between racism, poverty, and environmental exploitation. Because the majority of the people who were working in the charcoal industry in Brazil, as well as the no, major, uh, majority of people, 62%, who were working in livestock farming, were forced labor. What in Brazil is called contemporary slavery. And, the vast majority of them were Afro-Brazilians from the northern part of Brazil, who, because of the afterlife of the transatlantic slave trade, live in such deep poverty that they were often able to be coerced into or tricked into um, unfree labor practices where their labor was not um, compensated, but where their labor was actually responsible for the destruction of wide swaths of the rainforest. So what we start to see in this instance is the ways in which the disposability of the forest in Brazil is intermeshed with the disposability of certain groups of people, whether it be the indigenous population or the Afro-Brazilian population. So basically my message is climate justice doesn't equal human justice. And that's what a lot of people like to think because it still makes that separation that doesn't recognize the ways in which we need a broader conception in order to appreciate the interconnections between ecological indifference and racial climates. What we need is a change of sensibilities, not only a change of sensibilities around racism, but also a change of sensibilities around how we see ourselves in relationship to life ways and living things. Perhaps we might tap into traditions that are still very much a part of um, traditions both in uh, North and South America that don't make this type of hyper-separation between humans and environments. And let us start to see the ways in which um, we, we don't have a human, non-human divide, but see the interrelationality between things. Leanne Simpson, an indigenous thinker, refers to it as the ways in which all bodies are embedded in the ecologies and in our intimate relations with the land. Perhaps we might start to move away from the very anthropocentric focus of my original image, not only anthropocentric, but white male image into a sensibility that recognizes the deep interconnections between things, between all things, and start to begin to develop attunements to world-making processes that don't make themselves through hyper-separation.
which don't order things according to hi hierarchies based on race or gender, that don't animate ecological indifference, and in which the ground for coupling the exploitations of humans and the exploitations of nature is undone. And there are lots of resources for beginning to develop our attunements to those ways of world making. There are in, in indigenous life ways that can provide resources. Um, Melanie Harris talks about um, earth honoring faiths within the African American tradition that are based on African um, philosophies. And there are also Asian philosophies that provide resources for ways of thinking. So climate justice, I argue, requires a real shift in sensibilities and a way of understanding the complex dynamics that result in those differential impacts. That they're, in a sense, the tip of the iceberg. And if we only focus on them, we don't understand the complexity of the situation that we need to address. So thank you for your attention. And I was asked to leave time for questions, so I'm happy to do that now. things to ponder. All right, I have a question. Um, can you tell me about the artwork on the cover of your book? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm, to remember her name, do you have my book with you? Yes. Let me get her name right. Thanks. So I was looking for a, um, so when you write your first book, make sure that you work with your publisher to get the cover image that you'd really like to have. One of the things I found when I published my first book is that they would not give me the cover image that I wanted. And so I fought really hard with my second book to get the cover image that I wanted. Um, actually, this was a funny story. It was a book called Revealing Male Bodies. And I fought and I fought and I fought and I got a Da Vinci sketch of a naked male body. Um, and so they put the subtitle right there. <laughs> so you really have to work on your cover image. And I wanted an example of a, um, I wanted an image that would give me, um, that would resonate with the themes of the book. And so I started looking at the work of African American women artists who were working on environmental issues. And one of them, one of them was um, Alison Jane Hamilton, who does a whole series of imagery. She um, grew up in Florida, has a fam there, her family farmed in Georgia, and she lives in New York City. She's a photographer who does various videoscapes. And this is actually an image of her in um, one of the canals in Georgia excuse me, in Florida, that's called the Slave Canal, because it was a canal that was dug by slaves um, prior to the, the Civil War when Florida was trying to get a passage in, in the middle part of the panhandle to the Gulf. It was never used. It was dug, but it was never used. It's still there um, because railroads came in and took the place of the ship boats that were going. And Hamilton took a picture of herself in the slave canal. And I, my press actually wrote to her and asked for the image. And she um, gave the image for free, which was incredibly generous, generous of her as an author. And so I um, added actually a preface to the book in which I um, talked about diving into the Wasaka, which is the river, with Alison Jane Hamilton, and intersperse my words and her words. And actually, if you go to Amazon, you can read the preface um, for free, because you know how Amazon gives you that little, little bit. But her work is amazing. She has a web page. She has a tendency to make videoscapes. 
And then because she lives in New York City, she'll project them with permission onto skyscrapers. So you have these massive art pieces being projected out onto the skyscrapers in New York City. So take a look at her webpage. So do you think that um, at the very end, our first step into trying to fix ecological indifference and the climate change and stuff is humans viewing nature as more one rather than separate, rather than we have control of it? So I think that as long as, so the question was, do I think that, I don't know if other people could hear because I had to come here to hear. Is that mic on? Is the mic on? I heard, but I had to come here to hear. Was it? OK. So the question was whether or not I think that um, not having a hyper separation between humans and, and other things is an important step for climate justice. Yes? Absolutely. Because I think it's not only that we hyper separate, but we, we hierarchize. So we see human life as, as different than in the sense of being only the only thing that's worthy of intrinsic worth. And we don't understand the way we're intricately interrelated <clears throat> with the ecosystems that we are a, a part of. In fact, I always stumble when I talk, and I dealt with this some in my book. There's no good way to talk about this. David Abram, who I um, mentioned on the slide, uses the phrase more than human world. That includes humans, but is not limited to humans. But even that's tricky because we still have human in the, in the phrase. So I talk about how hard it is even with our language to talk about this. Um, but once you start to see this hyper separation, particularly if the, quote, the environment is seen as lesser than, the way is paved for also seeing certain life forms as lesser than. And the problem is we have not, particularly in the West, seen all life forms as equal. You know, historically this changed over time. Women were seen as lesser than men. But we also make racial decisions that don't see all humans as fully human. So with that hyper-separation becomes the fall into less than fully human. And there are a number of theorists who are now working on this. Um, so Jackson's book, Becoming Animal, is a great one to take a look at if you're interested. Ah, oh, Stravinsky. Thanks for a thoughtful lecture. Um, when you talk about indifference, you use examples of people who have a lot of indifference, like Bolsonaro. And I can think of a few other politicians that I don't like who have a great deal of indifference to the issues that I care about. Um, but I'm wondering if, um, you know, if we turn to some other examples of degrees of indifference or detachment, um, if we can start to theorize how is it, you know, we should conceive of right attachment or right caring. Um, yep. So, I mean, I, I, I mean, I just speak personally, but I think like many people, you know, I compost, I try to drive a car that has halfway decent gas mileage, sure. I teach about environmental history, I mean, I do all sorts of things, right? But I am not like the woman who lives in Brooklyn who has only reduced her trash to, you know, one bag per year, uh, right? So, like, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about, you know, what is the proper level of attachment um, to these sorts of issues. At, at some level, we all have to detach or else we just go crazy. Mm -hmm. So um, when I talk about environmental indifference, I'm not saying that people don't care about the environment, that you know, when you walk outside, you don't enjoy a sunny day that isn't too hot anyway, that you know, people don't en enjoy bird songs. I'm giving you all the things I really like right now, but you, know, you, can, fill in, you can fill in the blanks. I'm really more talking about this, this hyper-separation in which we don't 
see the, the interrelationality between things in which we don't think about relationships, deep relationships where we are of and in environments. So that there isn't a simple answer for the type of relationality we should have. I mean, that sounds like a, a version of your question. And in fact, it's just fascinating. I've been reading a lot of indigenous philosophy that is trying to deal with this very question of what is the proper kind of relationality to have with land, with what we call environment. And the answer is, it's always specific to particular places, to particular people at particular times for particular reasons. And one always has to be attentive to the relations and to think about the impacts of all the various different types of relations, but not hierarchize them. So it isn't a simple answer, and I can't give you one, um, but it's to be attentive to this form of relationality. One thing I really worry about working in the field of uh, climate justice, and I understand this completely, but the ways in which a lot of the um, resources that are given for, to people for dealing with climate, deal with it in terms of things we can do as individuals. And they're things like, let's reduce our waste, let's use less plastics, let's drive our cars less, let's use public transportation. You know the shtick, right? Really, the problem is not you and me. The problem is the way in which our society is structured in particular ways around um, consumption around what we're consuming and how we're consuming it. It's not you and me that's going to make a difference. We can make a little difference. But if we really want to make a difference, what we need to do is push back at the ways in which we have a, a global system that is both um, taking resources and using the, from certain groups of people and using them unfairly for other groups of people. And that means it's not going to be an individual action that I can do. It means it has to be a mass movement. Maybe transformation, maybe revolution. But I worry about the way in which we focus people on what I can do, what you can do individually. And we don't focus on how this really needs to be systemic changes. We're not going to change redlining practices and the histories and legacies of redlining practices by my changing how my greenhouse gas signature. We're really going to have to think about what does this require for more equity in a country where groups of people were made much more vulnerable to heat waves, for example. And that might be um, redistribution of wealth, might be a totally different way of thinking about what we need to change, a little more radical. Thank you. Um, you made a reference just now to the circular economy, which would, which would in many ways alleviate a lot of our problems. Do you see um, industry, I mean, I think right now it's industry that's leading that charge. How can we accelerate that? Mm. Well, I was, you know, I was really optimistic in, the, in Obama's first term because he kept, trying, he was kept talking about green jobs. And it seemed like, you know, um, one of those win-win situations where we could enhance our labor force, give people, you know, train people into jobs that would make a difference for them and make a difference for the economy. And that just hasn't happened. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that we have, you know, money for infrastructure um, enhancement because you know, one of the, one of the grants that um, Kristen talked about was to take us to New Orleans and talk about crumbling infrastructures. But, you know, it's Band-Aids on problems. And it's important to get those Band-Aids on because there are people that are living downstream of those problems. But it's not, it's not going to be the solution. And, you know, more and more I'm, I'm hearing, including the scientists I work with, who really want a difference to happen, saying, look, we have to economize it. We have to economize. We have to make, if business will make profits doing this, then it's going to happen. 
I worry that that's just going to get us into a different kind of pickle. But I don't like have a sol I don't have a solution to this. There were times, you know, I used to go to the Frameworks Convention because I really believed. When I started going to the Frameworks Convention, believe it or not, nobody was talking about climate ethics. Nobody was talking about climate justice. And so it seemed like, well, you know, if we could talk to negotiators and talk to them about their ethical responsibilities and talk to them about justice, it'll make a difference, right? No. Because if you keep it at the nation state level, it, there, you just can't find a solution that way. So I actually stopped going to the Frameworks Convention. It's possible that we'll find, you know, a lot of people are hoping for a technological fix. Um, but, you know, it may happen if we could calcify carbon cheaply. That, I think, would really make a difference. But I, I really don't know. I really don't have answers. I just have the problems. And they keep me up at night. I, so I know that individual carbon emissions are negligible in comparison to like corporatized carbon emissions because like a relatively small number of corporations produce a large quantity of the world's carbon emissions. Yep. So do we think that if we shift the thinking from what can the individuals do to what can the government require corporations to do that we will see more climate justice as they are required to stop small groups of corporations from pumping out carbon emissions that affect billions of people? Yeah, so I, I think that that's on the road to a good track if we can mm -hmm. really have an impact politically. Um, and there are a lot of really important organizations who are trying to do that. You know, one that I'm very fond of is Interfaith Power and Light, in part because I love that title. But it's a non-denominational religious organization that is working to both raise awareness about climate change, but also have political um, impact. And they're trying to organize people um, to make a difference politically. <clears throat> I'm not super optimistic with current political situation, but I think we have to keep trying and thinking about how we can make a difference, particularly you all, because you know, you're our future and you can make a difference, but that's where I think we have to make a difference. And I, I'm not opposed to reducing your carbon footprint. There's nothing wrong with that and it's you know, a good thing to do. But I think if you really want to spend your time wisely, see what you can do about changing the structures. And maybe we can do that politically. I'd love we think we can. I think I can. So uh, a lot of times uh, community yeah. activists and community leaders, um, and, and specifically these sorts of neighborhoods that have been historically disadvantaged, will want development in, in order to try to improve the economic situation. We want buildings. We want convention centers. We want development, development. So um, in the concern about heat islands and, and those kinds of things, has there been any concern expressed that ecological attention um, is precisely the thing that will prevent us from uh, improving the economic uh, environment of our communities? Well, <laughs> So it's complicated. It depends on how, how the changes are made. So it's certainly possible to get more. And you know, a lot of architects are looking at ways in which we can green our building infrastructures. Um, you know, Charles and I debate this all the time. Um, but you know, it really would be more efficient to live in um, much more environmentally effective, so green buildings, um, lead buildings, but where there's density. If you have public transportation, if you have shops close by. One of the problems we have right now is a lot of our density requires, um, uh, brings about other problems with it. But you really have to be careful because it's who has their finger on what the, the you know, redevelopment is looking like. So I looked at what happened in New Orleans, where um, a lot of the public housing that got damaged by Katrina and then Rita behind it, 
happened to be built, not all of them, but the older ones, happened to be built in the higher lying ground in the city of New Orleans. Guess what happened to that land? The public housing got moved not only to lower land, but often to land that's outside the protection of the levee, and that land got um, new expensive housing districts put into it. So you have to be really careful how that redevelopment happens. There's ways to make it happen that would be both um, attentive to relations with environments, put a lot of green space in there, you know, have green, um, maybe even urban farms on the roofs, um, have density housing, have public transportation. But making that all come together is really hard and often isn't in the... Now I'm sounding like I'm, I'm uh, contradicting an early statement, but because it's not, sometimes not profitable, developers won't go in that direction. But yeah, there's always a tension. Always a tension. Yep. It's a really hard problem. We could continue the conversation over food and drinks. <laughs> Shall we do that? Um, yes. Will you join me in thanking Dr. Thank you.